So our next speaker is Adrian Roll. And just while he gets set up, I'll just give you a bit of bio about him. He's the Managing Director of JMAG Precision, a career in precision ag, or digital ag as he likes to call it, um, start at grassroots level on a family farm near Young in New South Wales about 15 years ago. So like, like our other speakers, um, part-time farmer, part-time capacity Wherever. building educator for all things precision ag. So he's very passionate about training farmers and training agronomists um, in using PA. Thank you. So he's got a bit of a bugbear with data ownership and today we're going to learn about um, how best to utilise data farming. Um, there's every piece of technology provides us with a new layer of data, so how to combine all that information to make better on-farm decisions. Let's welcome Adrian. Thank you. That was enthusiastic, thanks. I would look out there and I know quite a few of you, friend and foe alike, so let's get into it. Firstly, uh, a bit of my background, as Nicole says, we've been doing uh, training now, and I actually see some of the people who have come through through the training, hopefully they've found it worthwhile. But I'm a real believer in that we need to build capacity in the industry if we're going to roll this forward. Because technology sensors is on an exponential curve, but adoption is virtually dead flatlining. So we have to build that into the industry. So let's kick off. Precision agriculture. Those who know me actually know that I really don't like that term because there's nothing precise about it. It's only slightly more accurate agriculture, but that's probably going to be hard to market. But the dichotomy is there's nothing precise about it, but we want to do it precisely as possible. So saying that, before you get excited about new technologies and stuff, I've learnt this the hard way. I've got well over $200,000 worth of kit sitting in a container at home that I've struggled to make a return on investment on. And my uh, family, my Minister for War and Finance, which is my sister who's in our business, she reminds me of that quite often. So firstly, before you worry about new technologies, remember, timeliness is way more important than any new tech. Getting your basic agronomics is more important than getting new tech. So unless you've actually got doing things on time and got your agronomics sorted, worry about them first because they are the low hanging fruit in your business that will make you most money. So the other thing with it, as uh, Braden just said, it's not as complicated as people think. I've been in the consultant space as well as farming. You make it more complicated, you can charge more margin because it's a dark art. So I really liked your approach. I've actually done a heap of stuff with the protein sensor. I'll talk to you afterwards if you're interested because you'd be interested to see a take on it. And it's about whole farm return. And it's about management. It's about your whole farm return for your management. So you want to make sure you're going to get outcome. If you're not going to make more dollars per hectare per 100 mils of rain or megalitre, depending on your system. Have we got any uh, irrigators in the audience today? Cracker, we'll pick on them. Um, what's the point of doing this stuff? And the three most important toolkits you've got in any precision ag program is the data set between your ears is the most important one you've got. The second one is proper ground truth in these data sets because data is another fantastic way for the industry to lie to you. And the third one is it's about doing an economic analysis. Cool? Making sense or not? The other thing I have problems with at the moment in the industry is data density. So I've been around long enough, I've actually seen this go full circle. When we actually start using data, we want to make sure that we actually use the densest data set we've got, and I'll explain that down the track. And there is nothing wrong with doing gridded soil sampling, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying you should be using your dense data sets for a targeted approach. So yield data, everyone got yield monitors? Anyone doesn't have a yield monitor? Yep, not brave enough to put the hand up in this thing. That's a great dense data set. You're generating it for free anyway. So why not we use the data set we've got? I've got a horror story where a guy actually paid four bucks a hectare to get elevation maps done. I mean, you've got more elevation data set than you know what to do with as it is. So we use the dense ones we've got to make the decision most we've got. So, and this is why, because I started off doing one hectare soil sampling, made a heap of mistakes. We won't go into talking about some of my early M38 work because it was horrendous. 
made all the mistakes that I'm still seeing being made in the industry, to compare to one that's got more dense data sets. So, what I mean by dense data set is when you put it into a piece of GIS software, all it is doing is mathematically filling the holes. It's making the decision in between. So the less dense the data set, the bigger guessing work we have to do. Whereas if you can set some point on the map, we have to guess less. So, saying that, if you get given a GIS map or a spatial map that doesn't make sense to you with your best data set, the one between the ears, that's number one data set you've got, it's probably not right. If it's not what you expect to see in the paddock because you're farming it, you're seeing it every day, it probably isn't right. So, the more data we put in there, the more believable the maps are going to be. And trust me, I'm still fixing some agronomic hangovers from when I was doing this stuff 15 years ago. I'm only just now 15 years starting to fix it up. I did some real kooky stuff with phosphorus and pH and all type of stuff that you shouldn't do. I actually, one of my favourite presentations is my greatest hits and failures. You blokes out there love to see other blokes fail. So everyone loves to see where I've really effed up in my, in my precision ag program in the past. So, and also too, keep in mind that there's different ways of doing this. So I can see some GIS experts out there in the crowd. You know guys know better than me, but like there's inverse distinct krigging, spline, inverse spline, which is all just nerdy GIS terms which is just different ways of making maps. That's all it is. And some have more validity than the other ones. And that's where education has got to come into play. So you guys actually understand. So when someone like me comes on your farm, you're not getting... So, here's a further example. Here's some yield data. One hectare grid. Can't really see the resolution in that. We have to get to a 1.7 hectare grid to get an 80% resolution in that yield data to try and replicate if we're going to do grid soil sampling. Now that's uneconomic. So what's a heaps better way to do is use our dense data sets, highlight the problem parts of the paddock, and then let's go and spend our money in these red areas or the orange areas where we're actually going to get a better bang for our buck. Because remember, it's all about dollars per hectare per 100 mils of rain. If we're not doing that, why are we doing it? It's just because things are technically feasible doesn't mean it's commercially feasible. So, I'll finish off on this real quick because I know I've got not enough time and I'm covering too much ground, so my problem. Your data density is going to affect your spatial accuracy of your maps. The accuracy of the management decisions you make off those maps are all based on those spatial layers. So yield, your profitability, and all the decisions moving forward, if you actually make bad erroneous errors off those erroneous maps, doesn't matter if you're the world's best agro. I can see a couple of the world's best agros in the crowd today, actually. You're still going to actually have uncertain agronomic outcomes. And I'm still having headaches 15 years later because of that. All right, next thing I'm really keen about in the industry is standardised spatial data. If anyone's come and seen the course, sorry Brent, we're rehashing ground here. You're sick of hearing this, I know. I know you are too, Benny. Anyway, standardised spatial data. All it means is standardised spatial data will enable interoperability. Interoperability is just movement of data between different platforms, yeah? So it doesn't matter what we call our Glyphi, a standardised system will bring it back to a common thing, which in this case is an active. It doesn't matter if it's weeds, phosphorus, anything. You can call it what you like, it'll bring you back to one common thing. So what that means is when you actually go to use it, you can suddenly do some cool stuff. The other thing is too, we want to keep stuff spatial. Now I'm not going to get into that because this is a concept that took me eight years to get. How long did it take to get you, Brent? Still getting there. Still getting there. So, it's, it's a hard thing to get. Once you get this concept, it destroys 95% of what the industry is doing. What we want to do is when I say stuff stays spatial, standardisation is just clean movement of data. Spatial is actually raw yield data in point form is spatial. In lots of software, when you surface it, it's a georeference image. It is no longer data. Because of that, we are leaving a lot of the value on the table. And I'll show you what I mean in moving forward. So, and also to enables the full movement of data. So this is what I mean. If we're actually using standardised spatial data, it means we can suddenly take yield data, throw it together and we can stack it. We can shake the data tree and see what falls out of it. 
We can do a heap of cool stuff. So multiple years worth of yield data, through together. Now we've got a temporal spatial trend map. So this is a long-term trend for that paddock. So you can see the red area is 75% and above. Dark area is 125% below. So, and there's a heap of spatial software out there that'll do this for you. Temporal stability, so that's comparing the long-term map to the current year of production. Whoa, we're seeing how it performed for that year. Seeing how yield data is starting to make money. No, I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you, but bear with me. Correlation matrix. Had a massive, got was very excited about Fortress back in 2005 when all this was kicking on. Realistically, you can't see it, but there's a correlation matrix that actually highlights where you should start looking in your paddock. You admit you can freely do all this in Excel, MS Paint, and cheap off-the-shelf GIS software if you want, but as long as you keep it in a spatial format. So that's the case where we're taking yield data, soil data, throwing it together, now we're getting insights into it. Sorry, I just saw one of my favourite people in the crowd. Um, Moving forward, suddenly we can actually use the same data set to prove that now 15 years later I've actually addressed the pH problems in that paddock. I now need to focus on focusing on phosphorus. It's now phosphorus is going to give me a return on investment. See how I'm using, and I should also admit, yield data is still king of the data sets in my humble opinion because it is the entrance point and the exit point of your program if you're all dry land blokes. Entrance is going to show you how much variability Exit is going to validate what you've done in the paddock to address it. Here's another example. Suddenly we're doing yield by elevation. In my country, over at Young, I was farm on the eastern slopes of Young. I'm either going up or I'm going down. I'm only flat at the top of the hill or at the bottom of the hill. You can see right here in this, so at the top of the hills I'm getting 4.6 tonne in weight. Down the bottom of the hills I'm getting 2.5. Massive driver in my yield. It's highly consistent. It's across all my stuff. You guys that are flat, how many guys would have 30 metres of elevation across their paddock? Yep, none. So you guys would probably still use elevation, but you turn it into a curvature map. A lot more value for you guys. All right, let's take basic agronomics, and we're going to compare it against yield. So back in 2014, 2013, uh, Secura came out, not sponsored by Bayer. But we can see here, in that year, and yes, I'm a broad acre farmer, not on the scale you guys are, but that paddock runs up there, similar soil types. We're taking uh, yield data and comparing it against an absolute agronomic event, which in this case is Secura, because I actually wanted to determine if it was economic back in 2014 to actually use Secura. So you can see here, the TREF landed 3.5, the Secura did 3.9. That was consistently across all the paddocks. So now I'm actually taking agronomic data sets or a sprayed applied log throwing against yield data, and I'm getting an economic outcome. See how standardised spatial data allow you to throw data sets together? That's the real value. So, here's an example of actually it not validating the outcome for me. 2014, again, I was messing around building my own little kooky equations for my farm. Because you've got to remember, precision ag is highly situational. What is working for me in these examples on the eastern slopes of Young is not going to work for you guys wherever you farm. That is why you actually have to use your own on-farm trials and all that. Is anyone doing on-farm trials? Anyone do Yeah, love your work. Anyone doing nitrogen saturation strips? Oh, top marks. Nitrogen saturation strips, doing on-farm trials for phosphorus nitrogen is actually invaluable to you. The GRDC released a report last year that showed that farmers who are doing that are actually 8 to 15% better off in their gross margins. The reason being is because you're building a data set that is relevant to your growing conditions, your environment, the crops you're growing, your management style. So the G to E equation is suited to you. And I'll tell you right now, who's ever pulled down a fence line and actually seen that paddock show up in yield data the next following years or even 10 years later? Yep, lots of nods. Reason is because that's past management history. The most variation we see in data sets is people driven. And that's timeliness is king. I can't say that enough. If you're not doing stuff on time, don't worry about this stuff, do stuff on time. Here, yeah, so back to the presentation. Sorry, those who know me know that I love a good soapbox. So, 2014, building different 
things. And if you listen to my father, I've blown up a lot of wheat crops in my time or strips in wheat crop trying to work this out. I finally started to work this out, started to get a handle on it. So in this thing, I was putting elevation, soil data, some NDVI, nutrition together, stacking it together in different forms. I thought I had it about right. Turns out I didn't quite have it right. Following year, I did get it right. But this told me here, so I've taken the sprayed applied event, compared it against yield. So this is an example of using yield as the exit point of your precision ag program. And you can see, yes, I did get a response. The average for the red areas, where that's inversed, is actually 0.3. But you can actually, this tells me that I really didn't push this hard enough. I left yield in the paddock because of it. I wish I had a protein sensor back then, because then I would have used that again to validate it. So, is that making sense how you can actually use it to actually learn? Every time you make a mistake in these programs, it's not the end of the world, because it actually tells you what you're not going to do next time. Yeah? Whoops, keep rolling on. So here's another um, event, 2016. I don't think I'll ever see a year like it again in my farming career. Decile 11, who'd have thought? Here's a Verilbrate program. Here's an actual application map. So that's what we did in the paddock. You can see there's a definite yield significant increase. So that was in canola. So, but let's take all the events. So now actually, because you're applied logs, what you've done in the paddock is an individual event. So that's one data set. Let's keep stacking those data sets up and actually keep the level of nutrients applied in the paddock. And then we can do nutrient by yield. So saturation end strip. So once again, I'm very technical in how I make my saturation end strips. I order my urea and generally what I've got left over is what I divide up. So that year I had enough left over to do uh, 220 kilos. Rest of the paddock I put urea up front. Just so we're clear, I'm in a crop grazing system. So that's probably pretty different to what you guys do. Uh, some very rate fertiliser. Uh, this is how I've made it. So we see how we're pulling applied logs, so they're individual data sets. We've now got ECA, we've got elevation, they're big drivers in my yield, stands out. Threw them together, came up with a thing, and here's a nitrogen saturation strip. Runs down through there. That's telling me that there is definite response. Nitrogen is a limiting factor in a lot of that part of the paddock. The red part didn't matter because it all died and got waterlogged and then got frosted. Yes. So, here's a late season one. So this is variable rate. This is solely variable rate because that is literally where we could drive in the paddock. If we drew into the blue areas, we consistently got bogged. So, rattle that forward. So we take all those data sets, we put them together, we come up with a nutrient in app, nut, English is my first language, nutri, nutrient applied map. We throw it together, we compare it against the yield. And you can see there is actually a bit of a response by all the different nutrient levels. So that's the kilos we spent. Not a great example in that paddock, but in the wheat paddocks I did, I averaged where I was doing this well and successfully, and I did some strip trials, come and do the training, and I'll show you those data sets. We actually got, for every dollar we spent on urea, we got a close to $4.80 return. We won't talk about what happened in 2017, well, we will in a sec, but that was a one-off thing. Bang, bang, bang. Doing it, and the only reason I could achieve that is because I had that nitrogen, uh, nitrogen saturation strip. So well done to you, sir. All right. Because of the massive stark variation in yield, I really struggled to make variable phosphorus play because it's generally, generally be a safer farming area compared to a lot of you guys. But so, once again, MAP, we put down the tube. So we had to flat rate because I use flutrophile. So 40 kilos down the tube is starter. Then we came in, come on, came in with the very rate phosphorus map in behind it. Nitrogen strip again, long term trial strip. And so we see here, now we're doing phosphorus by yield. And what that tells me is, and everyone knows. 
plant, phosphorus becomes plant available over time, so we're going to have to see, but there really was not a penalty by actually saving the money on putting the phosphorus down. So it didn't cost me anything, so happy days. We then go into the nitrogen applied. Here's an example where I didn't make a return, or not a significant return, on our urea. But we've still got our nitrogen saturation strip thrown down there, still showing up by nitrogen applied. See, we didn't get a response. But that's still all right, because it didn't really cost me that much money to set up. Like, I factored that out, it cost me an extra eight bucks a hectare. But it has, in a sense, saved me money, because I was able to then put the product where it needed to be, so it hasn't really cost me anything. But I didn't get the response, because I didn't have the season run through me. But this is an example of using it as a data set as risk mitigation. Because if I had a had a soft spring, and let's never talk about 2017 again, especially in canola yields, badly burnt, anyone else? Not brave enough to say, a few nodding heads, yeah. So, but I had the potential, if I did have had a spring, I had the data sets there, I'd done the legwork to actually turn around and show myself and validate it to me that I could have then gone out and gassed up those crops without fear of blowing them up and actually got a return. So I haven't really lost, but I didn't really get a return. So making sense? See how we can set ourselves up. Precision Ag is a great risk mitigation tool. Don't know if any of you guys saw this. This is done on livable plains. I feel no, don't feel sorry for this guy. Anyone who can pull off three decent crops in a two year period, don't feel sorry for. This was done by a guy called David McGavin or Scooter McGavin. Hates people know him as Scooter. We couldn't get anyone to be interested in to help us doing this. So this is multi-hybrid planting. And this is in sorghum. So what it is, it's actually matching the genetics of the crop or the plant to the soil types. And this is technically feasible to do today. This isn't pie in the sky. You can go and buy this stuff out today. And there's actually a company that's setting this up to do with wheat. I was actually up at the PBI at Narrabri last year talking, uh, last week talking about this and they're super excited about it. They reckon there's going to be massive yield increases. We have to build the data sets. So what we did is we took his elevation, turned it in curvature mode. ECA data, there's actually one missing. We actually used a soil spectrometer. We used a quasi poor man's fault soil spectrometer. Long term yield, see that line coming down there? He's got a road that runs off there. That's the spillway drain. Normally gets more rain. We came up with multi-hybrid map. I forget which is which. Uh, MR Taurus is, handles better dry conditions. MR Scorpio yields off its head. It has been known to fall over. And we, we tried different replications. We did nine, nine replications. Two of them cost him money. Uh, five, two, yeah, five. He didn't, was a, you know, not a great return. But then he had two that we got massive returns to. And if he had have actually used that one, he would have got 900 kilograms a hectare increase. That one paddock would have played for the $70,000 planter upgrade. Believe me or not, but that is what happened. And you can also do cool stuff and throw logos in here. We sewed his logo in there. I've now, we're doing it again this summer, I've actually worked out how to hide logos in the background of his maps. So we're going to be correct about what we put in there next time, I think. Alrighty, so see how we can actually use our data sets to get a lot of insight. How am I going for time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, awesome. So see how we're throwing data sets together is worth a lot of money to us and we get a lot of insight out of it. Yes, no. So your data is actually worth a lot. Now, has anyone heard the figures running around from the P to D and all that research stuff? The Australian collectively data set is worth $405 million raw, $1.8 billion to the industry. It's a lot of money. That's why we're getting a heap of these dudes turning up in the industry. So, one of the things you've got to understand about data, data is non-compete. So it doesn't mean that if I have a copy of Thane Pringle's data, I told you I just saw my favourite person, Thane Pringle's data doesn't affect Thane's ability to use it. Okay? So it doesn't, me having a copy of your data set doesn't affect your ability to use it. 
Now, very grey area, data can't be owned. And the person who generates the data actually has the best claim to the data. So, I come onto your place as a contract header, dude, I flick the yield monitor. I own that yield data. You get Eva, sorry I'll pick on you now Eva, you send Eva the maps to do her GIS magic on, she does the GIS magic, she owns the GIS data sets. You send it to Golda, he's doing the agronomy, he does the agronomic work, he owns the agronomic data sets. You've paid for that the whole way around and you don't technically own anything. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about this stuff. And the other thing is data doesn't have value until you use it for something. Okay. But my take on it, the real turn on investment from those data sets is actually in R&D and agronomic insight. So the figure they throw around for you guys is $70 a hectare return in the future. Realistically, that's not in folding cash. That's actually just going to be increased productivity. Like they've proven. Field scripts over in America, which is a Monsanto thing if you trace it back by Climate Corp. They've shown that you can halve the time it takes to get new varieties to market. Now that is a significant saving and it's also an agronomic benefit to you guys. Setting up strip trials is where you're going to actually get a lot of bang for your bucks. Doing benchmarking, not business benchmarking, which we can do today, but actual proper agronomic benchmarking. Building regional specific indices. Because let's be honest, you guys really don't care about my data sets on the Eastern Slope of Young because it's not representative, it doesn't mean anything to you. But you probably clear if you're farming west of town here about the data sets that are collectively for the west side of town. Now we can do that easily and cheaply but only if we use standardised spatial data. Cool. Here's an example of what's going on in the industry. I had to change the person I used because they sent me a nasty letter and said they were going to sue me. Hopefully these guys don't sue me. Good little startup. It's off their website, publicly available information, so I'm not disclosing stuff you can't find. If you read here, and I've got no problems with these guys doing this because they're transparent. So basically, customer grants AgriWeb perpetual worldwide transferable non-exclusive right to access, use, adapt, mostly reproduce, reformat, transform, process, commercialise, exploit, create derivative materials from the data to the extent necessary to achieve such an example. Customer agrees and acknowledges that AgriWeb intends to use and or aggregate data in conjunction with other information collected or obtained by AgriWeb and the customer agrees that AgriWeb is permitted to make full use, commercialise and exploit of data for those purposes. That's fine. If they can get people to sign up to that data agreement, good on them. And I've got no problem with them because they've been transparent. There's a heap of companies that aren't. I've actually had discussions with a lot of software developers and stuff at the moment and they actually argue that they actually have to be able to commercialise your data because otherwise it's not worth their while building the software because farmers won't pay for software. What that says to me is, no, your software is just crap, so farmers won't pay for it. If you build decent software, farmers will pay. I guarantee you, if someone will give me a one in seven return off a piece of software, I'll pay for that. Now if we go to the other extreme, so these are the AgX guys. Guiding principles, we will not sell your data. We will not share your data with those who ask us to share it with, blah, blah, blah. Use of information, goes through and it says we will not aggregate your data and all the rest of it. But these guys just spell out in black and white that your data is your data, they won't aggregate it, they won't sell it, they won't use, they're only going to use it to help. They actually say further down that they will sell your data but only at your request and you actually have to line up the sale. They'll facilitate it. Start contrast in the data world, the massive data grab that's going on. Now I've got a problem with this because I actually don't think, as we've just said, most of that $1.8 billion is going to be non-financial. Now this isn't racist because I am one. Too many middle-aged white dudes that grew up in the analog, analog age are making the decisions on this. That's the real problem. And that's why there's a massive disconnect. This is actually where I have a problem. Well-known agronomic service providing company. I had to, what do they call it, Re redact it? Is that what the Americans call it? Because they were going to sue me. Um, and I figured they had deeper pockets than me. So I figured if I put redact it, 
they'll have to publicly acknowledge it that it's their contract, so hopefully they won't. Anyway, who wants to sue an old farm hand from young? All right. This is a 2015 contract. This is a new one that I'm not meant to have at all. But one of my clients gave it to me, or people who went through the course gave it to me. So, this is hidden on page 11 of a 13 page contract with a well known agronomic company. So, we'll be limited to using raw data and information in aggregated format by combining it with other data in a way that is no longer personally identifies the customer. So, yeah, fine, they're going to use the data, but they're not going to have it. We'll be limited to using the raw data and information in data and or aggregated format by combining it with other data. Raw data shall include all raw data, including the lands or farm equipment, including farm equipment information and harvest data. They're agronomists. What right do they have to your yield data? Ownership and use of aggregated data shall at all times own the aggregated data and shall be entitled to use the same full purpose of providing services to its customers. Aggregated data shall include all data resulting from the combination and or aggregation of certain raw data with other data in a way that no longer personally identifies the customer. So they're not going to tell people who you are. They might sell your data off for forecasting and help with planning stuff. Ownership. 2018, shall at all times own the aggregated data and or data. Well, for starters, what's data? Well, it could be interpreted as your raw data, very grey. Shall be entitled for use. Aggregated data shall include all the data resulting from combination and aggregation of certain raw data with other data. Data shall be derived from data resulting from certain raw data. So they're going to actually sell your own data now. Gets better. Private information shall include any identifiable information that is not publicly available, including the customer's name, but does not include aggregated data or other aggregated data information that can be associated with a specific individual. Private information shall in include any identifiable information that is not publicly available, including the customer's name, but does not include data and or aggregated data or any other aggregated information. So they're not going to tell them your specific name, but there's no anonymity in these data sets. There's a latitude and longitude assigned. It's pointing straight to your farm. I don't know about you guys, but you wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to work that stuff out. That I have a problem with, because that is underhanded. Now these guys, I've actually spoken to them, and they sell themselves. Oh, we're like Google and Amazon. We're doing it so you can have a better experience as a farmer. No, that's not true. We sign up, we don't really care that Google and Amazon collect data on us because it actually enhances our, our user experience in it. This is a better example is actually to compare it to Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word sells you the software and then that would be like Microsoft Word claiming that all everything that you wrote on that piece of software on Word, they actually own your IP. Because what is generating that data set is your IP as a farmer. How you've generated, how you've done it, that's your IP. It's how you make a living. I've got a real problem with this stuff. If they're open and transparent, you sign up to them, good on them. They've conned you in. But this is just hiding it. So, why does everyone want this data set? Your data. Oh, it's found me, it latched onto me. Well, they're all talking about big data. You guys all had an experience of big data? Heard those conversations? Everyone's having a conversation up here, big data, big data, big data. Well, big data is going to be incredibly powerful for us collectively as a farmer. It's only going to have real value if we actually get our hands on it and control it collectively. And the reason why I can't see any big company actually doing it is because this is your data set at the moment. It's a mess. Who actually makes sure that they actually calibrate their yield data? by types, paddocks, and all the rest of it. Anyone? Hey, of course you, yeah. You're the right demographic to do this stuff, bro. There's a real demographic shift happening in the industry at the moment. I'm surrounded by 20 year olds, and geez, it makes me feel old. And it's probably in multiple, multiple formats, multiple silos. If we're gonna actually do this, we need to get everyone's data set to look uniform. We need it in one pool, one spot. Now there's multiple ways of doing it, and only then will we achieve big data. 
That's why there's a massive data grab going on there. That's why everyone's trying to get you to sign up to their program, to lock you in. Now, how are we going to fix these problems? So collectively, we as farmers, this is a bit of industry, cover your ears for this one. So collectively for farmers, if we actually got together and worked together in data cops, and there's several starting up at the moment, like BCG, there's the Accelerate Ag program, which is by Central West Farming Systems and Wantfer and all those type of things. It actually means that you guys will actually generate and benefit from your data. Because as I said, most of these companies don't care about big data in the current year of production, so they can sell you the product. The real value to the industry as a whole is actually in R&D. It's that historical data set. That's the real value. That's where you're going to get your 70 bucks a hectare increase if we do it all. So, to achieve this, Oops, go to that second one away. We have to educate the industry. We need to build capacity. We need to actually have people out there who actually understand and tell you what the data sets are. I'll pick on you, Eva. We need to have 10 more Eva Moffats. Okay? Um, we need to build education. So that education training program we've got, it's only Tokyo. There's bug lugs up the back. You can go and see Matt Notley. Um, it's the starting process of it. You, John, dear guys, down the front here, I'll pick on you. You guys, I know you desperately need to have more people out in the field servicing this type of stuff, yeah? We need to build capacity. We need to actually build the agronomists out there who actually understand the data sets. So this, to me, is why to get to this stage is a slow burn. We have to build the industry before we get there. I'll be retired by the time you people are making the full use of it. Now, to get to this stage, to the next stage, you actually have to develop trust. So, use that agronomic example. The agronomist on your farm, if he's from that company, he's there because you trust him. Yeah? You wouldn't have him on the farm otherwise. But the thing is, do you trust his bosses down in a big city somewhere? He's remotely removed from you. Especially when you can actually see the advantages of using that. And a great example of where big data can be used against you was the half Purdue chicken case. Case in America, first of its time in the world. I might have got that around the wrong way, but anyway, Google it. What it is, is there was a company collated a lot of the chicken farming data in America. They actually got there and um, <coughs> turned around and sold that data set to the companies that were buying the chickens. What they then did was they then actually re-engineered those data sets, worked out the cost of the chicken to the pound of chicken two per square foot of cage, and guess what they did? They formed a cartel and set the price, of, the price they were going to pay at that level. And like, I'm not saying that there's some Machiavellian process going on in, a, in a Australia right now, but that is why we don't want to have anyone who supplies us inputs or actually sets the prices for our product to have control of our data set because it is a short jump to that stage and we end up peasant farmers again. I'm doing a good enough job of going broke without the help of someone else. So that is why we need to develop trust in the industry. We need to have open and transparency. It's very cool by our hold hands. But that is really what has to happen. So I'll wrap up here real quick. Go and see this bloke up the back. See him, he'll be outside. There's a training, there's a whole heap of stuff. We're actually just done a cert for. Is the course any good, Brent? I don't know. I'll yep. put him on the spot. There they are. The horse is, is it good, Rob? Okay. It's very functional, very practical. It's about how you guys make money. It's about how you use your own data sets. It's about how you interpret them with a keen focus on dollars per hectare per 100 mils of rain. Or megalitre if you're cheating near a guy and can make it rain. So, go and talk to Matt, get signed up for the course. Now we come to the most important part of the talk. I collect and restore old motorbikes. If anyone has any old motorbikes in their shed, please come and see me before I leave today and we'll go out and have a look. And I'll give you a low ball offer and we can take it from there. Thank you very much.